I'd like for you to take your Bibles with me this morning and turn to Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. You know, the older I get, uh, the more I see the, the folly and foolishness that men and women get themselves into by misinterpretation of terms and phrases in the Word of God. You know, words are important. And the way the Lord states things in His Word are absolutely essential that we use all the tools that we have at our disposal to properly understand the meanings and implications of what He tells us and has written down so plainly and clearly for us in His detailed Word. You know, he, he's told us through his apostles, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not be ashamed, rightly dividing, rightly interpreting, rightly applying the word of truth. And that, that's our responsibility. You know, I've told you for years as I've been your pastor, I, I never expect anybody to just follow and swallow everything that I say just because I say it. And I do not take offense if you hear something that's questionable uh, that you would at least give me the opportunity to discuss it with you. And let's talk about it honestly and in a forthright manner and in a civil manner without shouting and yelling and calling me calling you a heretic or you calling me a heretic. You know, let, let, one thing is certain. If, if our hope is Christ and His imputed righteousness alone. We ought to be able to get through anything, shouldn't we? And I'm going to tell you, I, yeah, one of the things, I, words like flesh and spirit and words like faith cause a lot of people a lot of problems. And it comes from this indoctrination that we've had all our lives in false religion. Because I'm going to tell you, there are, there are about as many different false concepts of faith as they are of religion. They define it and defend it in a variety of different ways. Most of them neither scriptural nor honest. Most in false religion today that I've encountered, they may have made faith into something that the sinner does or something that they've been enabled to do. Something done by the sinner, namely this. And this is the one that they get so hung on. They think that faith is just... Simply stated is it, is believing or accepting or relying upon or calling upon Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. That's what they've reduced faith to. But the sad thing about doing that is saying, well, faith is when you believe or you accept or you rely upon Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. They have unwittingly ultimately made faith a condition of salvation. But in reality, true faith, God-given faith, that which the Scriptures refer to and call the faith of God's elect, that true faith is the fruit and it is the effect of regeneration and conversion. In other words, the faith of which we're talking about is the evidence that one has indeed been born of God. That faith of God's elect, you know what it rests in? It rests exclusively in the canon of what God has revealed concerning who Christ is, what He did, what He actually accomplished, where He is now, and what He continually does as our advocate, our mediator, our substitute, our surety, our redeemer. Sad thing is, I have found out as time goes on, a lot of new converts to Christianity. And I, I'll give them the benefit of the doubt. I think they believe the gospel. They, from what they've told me, what they've shared with me, their hope is in Christ. And in His righteousness alone, His imputed right. That's the language that they use. But I'm convinced more and more that because of a lack of, of spiritual and, and scriptural instruction and teaching, I tell you what, you can't teach yourself. I, nobody, I, I never learned it anyhow. 
I wasn't a trigonometry or an algebra or a geometry genius. And the reason was, number one, when they tried to teach me, I didn't listen. Number two, I didn't care. Because I never understood what making us coming up with a square root or whatever it is of a cone going to affect me in my day-to-day -day life when I was selling a water pump to somebody. <laughs> it just didn't make any sense. But I tell you what, you wouldn't go to a science teacher to teach you algebra. And you certainly wouldn't try to figure it out on your own. Because I guarantee you, you'd come up with wrong theorems, wouldn't you? And that's why when the Lord God saves his people, you know what he does? He gives them and puts them in situations and circumstances where people can teach them and instruct them. And that, that listen, doesn't make the teacher absolutely correct. I don't know if I might have told Kenny this this week. I mean, I, I find myself, when I deal with these young guys, I find myself falling back on the same thing that I said I'd never, ever do. I've been doing this 30 years. <laughs> Big deal. Yeah, you can learn something from people, even newborn babes in Christ, you can learn some things from them. But I tell you, in turn, they can learn some things from you. Yeah, experience counts. When you've, when you've grown, go, yeah, the, the, the Christian life is a growth process, is it not? I, I know and I understand things now more clearly than I did back when I first began. Doesn't make me more saved or more qualified or more fit or more entitled to life. It's just experience and patience and wisdom and learning that God has given me as he's bought, brought me through all these trials and difficulties that he has put in my path in this life. And all of them always come back to this. Everything the Lord has sent my way and that he sends the way into the lives of his children always drives them back to the same place. It drives them back to Christ and his accomplished day. So I want to spend some time trying to discern what faith is. One thing I do know, we're starting here in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, but the Apostle Paul spent almost 11 chapters, folks. 11 chapters setting forth Christ's superiority over every part of that old mosaic economy. Every bit of it, that covenant. If you go back, we don't have time to do it. If you want to know, go back. We, all of our studies except for Hebrews 10 and Hebrews 11 are on sermon audio. I don't know how these didn't get there. But here's the thing. In the opening part of this epistle, he actually proved that Christ alone set that entire covenant aside. And he set it aside by doing exactly what he said he'd do. Remember they said, don't think that I came to destroy the law. I didn't come to destroy the law. I came to fulfill the law. For not one jot or one tittle will pass from the law. The smallest apostrophe or comma will pass from that law until all are fulfilled. It is finished. Every jot and every tittle. And he did it, folks, by establishing a righteousness of infinite value. A righteousness that actually justifies and demands the eternal salvation of every sinner whom he represented as their substitute, their surety, their mediator, their redeemer, and their friend. Listen to you. By the we read this every time we take the Lord's table. By the which will we are sanctified. Not in the process of being sanctified. This is an event that has occurred already. By the which will we are sanctified, declared holy through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once. You hear it? It says for all. For all's in our touch. Did it one time. He goes on. For by one offering. He hath perfected. Forever. Them that are sanctified. Back in Hebrews chapter. That's Roman Hebrews chapter 10 verse 10 and 14. In Hebrews 9 verses 11 and 12. He says this. 
But Christ, being come and high priest of good things to come, by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, not that Solomonic temple, neither by the blood of bulls, or goats, and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place. Our Lord never stepped inside the temple. Except when he went in that time to read. But he, ne he never went behind the veil. Because you know what he wasn't? He wasn't a priest after the order of Aaron. He had to be a son of Aaron to go back there. But that was an inferior priesthood. That was a priesthood had, had a beginning. It began when God chose Aaron. And it had an end. And it had an end. You know what it had an end? When, when the veil got torn in two. On the day our Lord died, that Aaronic priesthood. Now they still try to carry it on, which is kind of strange. They don't have a they they got a temple. They don't have the Ark of the Covenant. They don't have any of the furniture, but they still going through the motion, slaying all animals. Folk, he he entered into a holy place. Where did he entered into heaven itself? And I like the way he states is having obtained eternal redemption. Didn't make it possible. He obtained it for his people. Now since there's absolutely no possibility that Satan can ultimately cause one of those for whom Christ lived, one of those whom God the Father chose in everlasting covenant of grace in Christ Jesus before the foundation of the world, there's absolutely no possibility that one who has been regenerated, converted by God the Holy Spirit can lose their salvation seeing they are in Christ and in Christ they have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. Satan's one goal now in this life, you know what it is? It's to draw the hearts and minds and understanding of God's justified saints, draw their hearts away from the glorious Christ, honor, and truth using the things of time. By that, what do you mean? Well, talking about our family and our friends and circumstances and situations, life itself. He gets our minds on everything and anything but the most important thing, does he not? And he seeks, his one goal is to fill our minds and our understanding with doubt and despair. That's what was happening to these Hebrew believers. How were they being filled with doubt and despair? Well, Satan used their family and their friends and their circumstances and life itself to discourage them. How'd they do that? You don't have a priest. Right? You don't have a temple. You've got no altar. <laughs> You've got no sacrifices. We've got everything. Come back over here. Who was saying that? Everybody who didn't believe and rest in Christ. Who was that? A lot of them's friends. A wealth of their families. Some of their employers. And see, because of that, they were being called to leave behind what that hope that they had rested in and come back over here. Come back where you'll have an altar, where you'll have a priest, you'll have a sacrifice. So the apostle in Hebrews is led by the Holy Spirit. He seeks to and he rightfully establishes the fact that in Christ, you know what? God's people don't have a high priest, do we? They don't call our high priest just a high priest. What is he? He's a great high priest. He's a priest forever. Not one who has a, a short time limit that, you know, Aaron served. He died, his son replaced him. And then after that, that son died and he replaced him. Over and over and over and over and over again. He has an everlasting priesthood without beginning and without end. What does that mean? His sacrifice stretched from eternity past to where? To eternity future. They have an altar, do they not? But folks, he says in Hebrews chapter 13, we have an altar they are not worthy to come to. Why? 
they're not in Christ. They're not covered with His blood. And I tell you what, they've got an inheritance, they think, but we have an inheritance. This is what's so comforting to me and you as God. Our inheritance can never be taken away from us. Ever. Where we're beginning today here in Hebrews chapter 10, the Apostle Paul sets forth the truth that forever alters the justified saints thoughts concerning what faith is and how true God-given faith is the only way, the only way a child of God can be made more than conquerors. Now notice what he says, verse 32 through verse 34. Hebrews chapter 10. But call to remembrance the former days in which after you were illuminated you endured a great affliction Flight, fight of affliction, partly whilst you were made a gazing stock by, both by reproaches and afflictions and partly whilst you became companions of them that were so used. For you had compassion on me in my bonds and took joyfully the spoiling of your goods, knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and an enduring substance. Wait, I'm going to lose everything I got for something I cannot see. But yet what I cannot see is of more value than what I can see. <laughs> love my wife. love my children. I love my daughter-in-law. I love my granddaughter. You know I do. But I tell you what, folks, all of it is temporal. Isn't it? It's passing away. And passing away a lot quicker than I physically want it to pass away. But I've got a better... And a more enduring substance. Yeah, isn't it interesting? He talks about in chapter 11. Uses the same word. Faith is the substance. Of things hopeful. I've got an enduring substance. What is it? That I'm becoming more moral? That I'm producing more good works? That I'm more holy now than I was when I started 30 years ago? No, what's the enduring substance? In Christ I have a righteousness. In Christ, I am secure. In Christ, I possess eternal life. And what's so interesting about the way he begins this section, he begins it with that little conjunction, B-U-T. And that but that he uses here refers us back to verse 25. What's verse 25 tell us? Not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as a man or some is, but exhorting... And so much more as you see the day approaching. We've got to remember now. These Hebrew believers to whom he's writing, what day is just around the corner? What's coming? The temple's fixing to go. And that which our Lord had told them on the day that they crucified him, when he went out and they, those women, remember those mourners right there mourning for him? And he told them, don't mourn for yourself. Don't mourn for me. Who you need to be mourning for? You mourn for yourselves. Because he says, this temple that y'all see, what's going to happen to it? There's not going to be one stone left standing upon us. They can all go. We're there. Almost. When he wrote this letter to these people. And here's the thing, all these verses in between from verse 25 down to where we've started at this morning, they contain a description of the evil against which he, we're warned. And what these people were warned. And I, I, the language he uses here, he talks about the, the, these afflictions. This word affliction that he uses when he talks about these believers. He says, you endured a great fight of afflictions. You know, that word would be been better translated persecutions. Would have been a better translation from it. And we know that's the case from the context. 
particularly with what he's about to mention. No, no mention next, because notice what he said. Believers, he says, every justified saint, all these that are about to endure these things, they are made a gazing stock. What does that mean? These believers were made a gazing stock publicly before their families, before their friends, and before their neighbors. These believers, these Hebrew believers who had rested in Christ as the Lord, their righteousness, folk, they suffered both by reproaches. Isn't that what he says? They suffered reproach. Which reproaches in this particular passage, it means public contempt. It means scorn which proceeded from malicious hatred. Our Lord said, if they hated me, they're going to hate you. I, we don't, we, we really, I mean, we get along with our family and our friends, but I tell you what, it would be interesting to know what they actually thought about us when they know what we, we say. And they understand, at least with their ears and with their mind, they understand what we're saying about false religion. These folks, they, they, they were suffering afflictions, suffering in their bodies, in their persons, in their position. They lost their job. They lost everything over the gospel. But in addition to this, he tells them also that they suffered in the persons of their friends. If they wasn't enduring it themselves, you know what they were seeing happen to their own brethren that believed this gospel, who they identified with and took sides with against this whole world? They suffered. It's the same thing Paul said to the Corinthian believers. If one part of the body suffers, who suffers with it? Listen, the church rises together, and you know what the church, true church does? It goes down together. If one part of the body hurts, we ought, we ought to be sympathetic and, and we ought to be empathetic to our brethren when they suffer, particularly over the gospel. But what's so interesting about this, he, he says that he calls them to remember all this suffering. Why? I mean, you think about, wouldn't, wouldn't you think that if, if we... Think about all the suffering that he's calling these people to endure. It caused them to, if you hadn't endured, you'd think, oh no, what's coming my way? Fill them with dread and with apprehension because of future suffering. But see, here's the thing. It isn't the suffering itself that he calls on them to remember. It's to remember the spiritual blessings that they had received and the victory that they had already enjoyed. Now, by nature, we don't think of things this way, but listen, afflictions and persecutions, you know what they were? Patience. Patience. All things work together, do they not? We know that. And they work for our spiritual and eternal good. We know Paul said this to the Roman believers in Romans chapter 5, verse 3. He told them, and he tells you and me. And not only so, but we glory in tribulation also, knowing that tribulation works patience. Be careful that you ask the Lord to give you patience. Because <laughs> the only way you're going to get patience what has to happen. Tribulation's got to come. Now, afflictions and sufferings in and of themselves, folks, they'll do us no good at all. Will they? But thank God afflictions and sufferings don't work alone. In the believer, they work together with the subjective graces of the Spirit. You think about this. Afflictions and suffering are the means in God's hands to fill our hearts with humility. Which, what's humility? True humility. It is a total dependence upon God in every situation and in every circumstance. That He knows what's best for us. True humility is this. Not my will, but thy will be done. I, if, it's, if it was good enough for our blessed Lord, is it not good enough for us? He who himself was eternal God said, Not my will, but thy will be done. And that how he taught his apostles to pray. Our 
Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. That's hard. I know afflictions and, and trouble and suffering and heartache and pain. You know what it causes? It causes believers to seek out who? The world? If you have problems and afflictions and difficulties and suffering that comes on you over the gospel, where are you going? You going to the world for comfort? Where do you go? To your brethren. Now, Paul calls on these people to remember these blessings that come by suffering and persecution for the sake of the gospel. Same thing our Lord taught us. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness sake. But theirs is the kingdom of heaven. It doesn't say because you're suffering you get the kingdom. He's saying that the ones that are in the kingdom, the, the ones who possess the kingdom, because they're in the kingdom, what happens to them? They suffer for righteousness sake. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and shall say all manner of evil against you falsely. For my sake rejoice and be exceedingly glad for great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. I'll tell you the absolute certainty of our salvation condition on Christ alone according to God's promise encourages you and me and it encouraged these believers and these Hebrew believers to part with all those things that were dear and near and dear to them. And notice here that God keeps and preserves us not by mysticism. And he doesn't preserve us by some sort of spiritual hocus pocus. And he doesn't preserve us by ignorance and unbelief or blind leap of faith. On the one hand, these believers, these Hebrew believers, saw the certainty of their salvation. And on the other hand, you know what they saw? They saw the Jews and Gentiles. They were a bunch of open idolaters. Producing good works. Those things that they had repented of and turned their back on. They, they had come out of that. And now they're being called to come back to it. Look at verse 35 and 36. Cast not away, therefore... Your confidence. What's your confidence? Well, here's Paul's. I know whom I have believed. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. If they kill my body, what I have confidence in? That he'll keep me and preserve me. And folks, he will present me holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in his sight. Paul reminds them of the certainty of the reward. He says, Cast not away therefore your confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. For he, you have need of patience, that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. Paul reminds them, and he reminds you and me, of the fact that all that we possess is based exclusively on one thing, on Christ's merits, on his accomplished death. And that always produces one thing, patience. Patience. Literally, that word patience here, it literally means the resignation of our wills and subjection to God's will, knowing that he is our covenant God and our Father. And this kind of patience that we're talking about will grow on no other ground but one. True God-given faith. And he says here, to have done the will of God is to continually... Here, to, What's the will of God? This is it. This is the will of God. That you believe on Him whom God hath sent. So he says, after you've done the will of God, he's literally telling them, you and me, what do we do? We continually abide in the absolute certainty of our salvation, expecting God to bless us and keep us and bring us to glory based on the accomplished death of the Lord Jesus Christ. But then he says this, cast not away your confidence. The very assurance and confidence which many people discourage believers from having. I've been told all my life, you can't be that sure about going to heaven. 
almost speak with contempt or it would discourage you from ever believing that you can possess eternal life. I spent all my life in false religion, and all the time I was in false religion, they told me over and over and over again, it's a good thing for you to doubt your salvation. Didn't they tell you that? They did me. They'd, they'd even go this far. If you don't doubt, you're probably not saved. But I tell you what, the very thing that they discourage you from seeking... And which they call presumption is exactly what God the Holy Spirit commands us and demands us to never cast away. Matter of fact, in Hebrews chapter 6, verse 17 and 18, he says it's the will of God that justified sinners, believers, have strong consolation. Because that's the same word that's translated confidence here. It's translated consolation there. We should do everything we can, make use of the means, every means God's given us to provoke this kind of confidence, which is an absolute certainty that God will do exactly what he promised me he'd do. Look at verse 37. For yet a little while, and he that shall come will come and will not tarry. Now, this is where we have to do some discernment when it comes to the Word of God. The Apostle writes here, Christ coming. And this is so important. This is not a reference here to Christ's second advent. And it's not a reference to the end of the world. What's it a reference to? It's a reverence, reference to here to Christ coming in His power to destroy Jerusalem and take vengeance on these Jews because what did the Jews as a nation done? They had rejected and crucified the Lord of glory. And then when God sent the gospel to them through his servants, what did they do? We'll accept it now. For the most part, what did they do? They killed his prophets, just like this, their parents had killed his prophets. Verse 38. Now the just, and I've got this, this verse, these two words capitalized. The just shall live by faith but if any man draw back my soul shall have no pleasure in him now there's a first and second application to this because I tell you what Paul didn't know nothing about me at this point in time <laughs> did he but he's talking about a specific group of people that he's preached the gospel to that have come to believe the gospel and at least openly profess that they believe the gospel and he's saying, if you draw back from this gospel, who's not going to take pleasure in you? I'm not. Paul says of them. So the first application of this truth belongs to who? These Hebrew Christians who would live, who would not perish. Now, this is the thing. Jerusalem as a whole is about to fall. The temple is going to be destroyed. The priesthood is going to be utterly taken away. And all those people that had put all their hope in that religious activity of Judaism, their hope was about to be destroyed. But he's saying to these believing sinners who had rested in Christ, is their temple, their tabernacle, their sacrifice, their priesthood, their all, when Jerusalem fell, what was going to happen to them? Not a dead young thing. And he's telling them that they'll live. The just shall live. How? By faith. And if you'll notice, a truly justified person, folks, he says they're going to live. This word, shall live, I looked it up again this morning just to make certain. It means to live, breathe, be among the living, not lifeless, not dead. Those in that temple, and those that served in that temple, what were they? Dead. Alive, yet dead. Alive physically, dead spiritually. It means to enjoy real life, to have true life, and worthy of the name of God. It means active, blessed, endless in the kingdom of God. Hmm? The means God uses for us to live is what? Faith. True God-given faith. A justified sinner's convinced 
of idolatry and the destruction of the Jerusalem and they were convinced that they were going to escape that destruction by disassociating it with it. Because I tell you what, if you were associated with that temple when that guy came through there and destroyed it all, what happened to you too? Just shall live and they won't perish. But then there's a wider application. Who's it to? Every believer in every generation. All those chosen in Christ. The just shall live. And you know what? They will never perish. Never. He'll live by faith, not trusting in their faith, but trusting or relying on Christ, the immediate object of their faith. And God the Father, the ultimate object of their faith. But if any man draws back, Whatever their pretense, whatever their excuse, it's certain that, you know what, God is never pleased or satisfied with those who leave the gospel. They're leaving. It doesn't reveal that they've lost salvation. What does it reveal? It reveals they never had salvation to begin with. Because he's already said, he's going to say in just a moment, verse 38, what do God's children never do? What, what, here's the thing. What can you never do? If you're a child of God, you cannot leave the gospel. No, you can't. It's impossible. Notice verse 39. We are not of them who draw back to perdition, draw back to judgment, but of them who believe to the saving of the soul. And we'll say this real quick. and we'll close. Notice that, that believing, faith, continuing loyalty and salvation, you know what they're all? They're inseparable. On the other hand, compromise and unbelief and disloyalty and eternal misery, what are they? They're inseparable. The person who has true God-given faith, they have salvation and they'll never draw back and they'll never perish. Why? God's convinced them of sin, of righteousness, and of judgment to come. That person has repented. That person who will not draw back, they've repented of dead works and former idolatry. If you hadn't repented, you know where you'll go. You'll go back to that old way. He understands how God's glorified and how Christ is exalted in salvation. And they understand how every single solitary one of God's warnings to him, they're warnings of a loving, covenant God and Father. They know that they're designed for his good or her good. And they heed the warnings that God gives about drawing back. They will not draw back. They heed the warnings without any legal fear of punishment and without any promise or reward, understanding and being fully convinced that all the warnings that are given in God's Scripture, and there are warnings in here, are for him to continue to grow in grace and knowledge of the certainty of their salvation based on the blood and righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let me say this in closing. The more we understand all the particulars of the gospel, the more we grieve over the lostness of our family and our friends. Is that not the case? But also this, the more we understand the particulars of the gospel, the more we're truly convinced of God's threat as well as what? God's promise. And that's the way God keeps his people. That's the way God does it. Not by hocus pocus and not by encouraging you and me to take some blind, blind leap in the dark. It's truly perseverance of the saints by God's preserving grace and power through the means that he's given us. Which means are what? His gospel that declares that in Christ we have been blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All the means that God has given us, prayer, worship, fellowship with our brethren, study of the Scripture, all these things draw our hearts and our minds to glorify and honor Christ, to love and enjoy the presence of God's people, and to glorify our God as both a just God and a Savior. Let's stand together and we'll be dismissed. I appreciate your presence. Lord bless you keep you till we see you uh, next Lord's Day. Bart, would you dismiss it, please?